Welcome, I'm Nick Vavis and this is City of Churches where we take a look at distinctive houses of worship and their parish neighborhoods right here in the Brooklyn Diocese. Now, today we're visiting a church that was described by the New York Times as Brooklyn's finest church when it opened its doors in 1892. We're also gonna talk about the important role the church played in the history of Brooklyn. Today we're on our way to visit St. Augustine Church in Park Slope, and you got to pass by Prospect Park. Now I'm here in the Grand Army Plaza, which is the main entrance to the park. Now the park is 11 acres, and it's actually pretty noisy right now here on Flappish Avenue, but as you get closer into the park, it's really quite peaceful and very serene. Now interestingly enough, the park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was also the designer of Central Park in New York City. Now most visitors will recognize the plaza's most famous landmark. It's called the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch. And if you look at it closely, it resembles the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, France. And it's huge. It's 80 feet high and it's 80 feet wide. Now when the arch was first dedicated in 1892, the President of the United States, Grover Cleveland, officiated at the ceremony here. Also in 1892, the main branch of the Brooklyn Public Library was established right here adjacent to the park. Now, if you go inside, there's millions of books, periodicals, newspaper articles, just about everything you could imagine. And it's also got a really extensive and impressive selection of history on Brooklyn. Now, it's been said, and some people notice, that the building itself is shaped like a book. So that would mean right behind me would be the binder, and then one flap goes down Eastern Parkway, and one flap goes down Flatbush Avenue. So there you have it, the makings of a book. This neighborhood is a great example of Brooklyn's famous brownstone architecture. And these classic homes are very popular and a real attraction to today's young families who are looking to move into the neighborhood. In 1973, the area was officially recognized by the Landmarks Preservation Committee. It was designated the Park Slope Historic District. And there's one house in particular that I'd like to point out. Now, back in 1888, this street was home to Mr. Thomas Adams. Now, if the name doesn't sound familiar, I'll give you a hint. The first one is, he's a candy maker. The second one is Chiclet's Gum. That's right, Mr. Adams was the inventor of the famous square gum and the iconic yellow wrapper. Now, he made the candy at his factory in Long Island City, and he was appropriately enough called the Chewing Gum King. This was the magnificent mansion that he commissioned for himself and for his family with the profits from the candy business. Now the exterior of the Adams House features a combination of brownstone, terracotta, sandstone, and brick. And the building has been called the best example of Romanesque revival residential architecture in New York City. Park Slope is also home to the parish of St. Augustine, which dates back to 1870. Around 1886, the parish grew to such an extent that they had to build a new building. They had to accommodate the spiritual needs of the increasing population of German and Irish immigrants. Now, on December 16, 1960, two planes collided over New York City in a dense fog. A crippled United Airlines plane miraculously missed St. Augustine's church and the school complex, but crashed into several nearby buildings on 7th Avenue and Sterling Place. So, we've arrived at St. Augustine, and all I can say is, wow! I just saw a family walk by, and the little girl looked up, and she went, Mommy, it looks like a castle. And, um, and it really does, and I think that's in part because of the exterior, which is the brownstone. It's, um, it's really quite beautiful, and it actually reflects the neighborhood, which is primarily brownstones. The only other color that contrasts is the green at the top of the bell tower and part of the church, which really adds a nice 
accent to it. Now, I know the bell tower works because I heard it while I was coming down the street. Um, another interesting fact about the church is the entrance. There's no center entrance to the church. There's one entrance on 6th Avenue and uh, one around the corner on Sterling Place. So if you're a bride coming down the altar, you got to do a little dog leg before you head down the center. Um, oh, also the rectory in which I'm looking at, it's made of the same brownstone exterior as the church, so it kind of mimics each other in terms of the style and the architecture. You know, it really is miraculous that the church was spared on that fateful day 50 years ago with the plane crash. And I know the church is very proud of the fact that it was able to minister to a lot of the families and, and the victims uh, on that day. And it continues to do so today. It ministers to the neighborhood here in Park Slope. So let's head on in. This is unbelievable. Hi, Nick. Hey, Father Bob. How Welcome. you doing? Come on up to the choir loft. I will. You gonna play the piano for me? Is that why you bring me up here? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Not so much. How are you doing? It's Welcome. nice to meet you. Welcome to St. Augustine's. Thank you. Thank you for having us, and thank you for taking the time for this tour. And one of the first things I would start out with when I walked in is um, the dome that's above the altar and the dome that we're standing under is mm. very unique. I haven't seen that in other churches. Well, we're standing um, in the choir loft, and as you can see, it's a, a, we have a double apse, just mm. like the rounded wall behind the altar. We have one here. And um, it's, it's, I believe, unique to a religious building in the United States. I don't believe there's another. There's a few in Europe, but they were kind of mistakes, architectural mistakes. But the architects, uh, the Parfit brothers who built this church, mm -hmm. I believe they wanted to have a wall of windows to light the church. And this face is 6th Avenue, which is uh, right. facing east. And so we get the morning sun flooding the interior. Coming through the, sta the yes. stained glass windows yes. as well, I wanted to ask yeah. you about and to, uh, yeah. to get some history from you. I'm seeing the music books and the, um, some of the instruments. Clearly there's a theme mm -hmm. since we're in the choir loft. Yes, they chose the theme of music since uh, it's the choir loft. And so each of these uh, large portraitures in glass is a, is a saint having something to do with uh, church music. For instance, St. Cecilia, one of the patronesses of church music. Okay. And in the lower scene here, there's a, she's playing the organ. Uh, as the angels turn the, the pages in the books, as you say. This is all the original stained glass when the church was built? Yes. Correct. Uh, the, the church was built in 1888, opened okay. in 1892 by okay. the Parfit brothers, and the second pastor of the parish, Edward McCarty, planned uh, all, the, all the parish buildings. They took their time so that they could have the best of everything. Uh, it took 30 years to finish the interior decoration of the church. I can believe it. Yeah, so it's a very unique church for, for the Diocese of Brooklyn. It's the only brownstone, completely brownstone church that we have. Mm -hmm. And as you saw outside, there are two uh, towers. There's a large, very large, 100-foot uh, tower on the north side, which is the main portal, main entrance, okay. and, a, and a smaller uh, tower on the south end here. Yeah, I'm used to coming in straight through the center door and straight down to the altar, and this is very unique, and right. then you come in from the sides. Yes, um, and you might have noticed outside, right above us, over this apse, mm -hmm. there's a very large uh, copper figure of the angel Gabriel blowing the horn. That was done by J. Massey Rind, one of the best sculptors of the 19th century. And the architecture on the outside, obviously, very gothic. Um, yes. And really striking. I was coming down 6th Avenue, and you can't not help but look up in awe. I mean, it's really yeah. quite amazing. The architects described the style as a 14th century English gothic. It's really high Victorian uh, gothic revival. Okay. So, who uh, designs that? Like, who actually came up with the concept and who decided it? Uh, Monsignor McCarty had a, an architectural contest okay. and invited firms from throughout the Northeast to, uh, to enter. And there were 10 firms that okay. uh, submitted plans and the Parfit Brothers uh, won. One. <laughs> and there was no prize offered because the cost of the church to begin with was $300,000. There had never been a church project in, in the city of Brooklyn for that amount. So they that was considered the prize that and you would get. this is the end of the 1800s, correct? Yes, we're talking 1887. Okay. So now, Father, there's something very unique about this church that I understand. It's an artifact 
mm -hmm. that um, has something to do with a future um, saint. Oh yes, oh and yes. I was hoping you could show me that. Clearly that's something very special about the church. Yeah, people have great interest in that. Let's, let's save that for the end. Be really? a little surprise for the end, yeah. Okay. The stained glass above the doors, which clearly is different from the stained glass in the rest of the church. Yes, a different yeah. artist. When the church opened in 1892, only um, the ornamental glass, uh, such as all the 16 entrance doors, mm -hmm. we're looking at tympanums above the doors, there are four of them, okay. and they were done by Lewis Comfort Tiffany, Tiffany Glass uh, So Company. that's Tiffany. Yes, okay. Tiffany. And uh, the lower panels have, uh, you know, gothic spires and turrets. Mm -hmm. And above, we have a central portrait of one of the four evangelists. Okay. And each one has unique flowering vines, uh, very beautiful glass. How much of all the glass, the stained glass, is Tiffany? The original windows here are Tiffany, okay. but the larger figurative windows, mm -hmm. they needed a lot more planning and fundraising. Okay. And so they came later. And of course, the baptismal font. This which... is the baptistry now, but as you can probably guess, it's not the original. It's the original font, but it was relocated. The baptistry was located at the entrance on, in a side chapel, okay. which was normal in those days. But after the, the liturgy was updated after the Second Vatican Council, mm. many churches moved the font. And then the bath that's on the floor. For the 100th anniversary of the building in 1988, um, when they moved the font here, they built a small pool behind so that adults could be baptized using a, a greater deal of water. We're entering the nave of the church, okay. and as we move towards the altar, to the north side here, we'll see this set of windows is dedicated to St. Monica. Okay. And so there's a picture of her family at home, her husband, children, mm -hmm. uh, pleading before St. Ambrose, and now the death of St. Monica. And then on this side, it's dedicated to St. Augustine. We have his conversion. Uh, he's reading St. Paul to the Romans in the garden and decides he wants to be baptized a Christian. Okay. And in the central uh, window, we see Augustine as a bishop. It's a very famous story, actually. And it, it follows a painting by uh, Pinturicchio. Okay. And this is the apotheosis of St. Augustine. <clears throat> After his death, he's being received by the, the Savior into heaven, and Monica, his mother, is waiting to embrace him. Yeah. Very vibrant. I mean, the, the stained glass is really it's so colorful, and it looks very new. But you said this is the original, correct, from when uh, the church was first these, built? These were done by Alexander Locke from 1914 to 1918. So it took him four years? And he worked on these himself in a, in a small studio right here nearby in Brooklyn. It's magnificent. It's what we call opalescent glass, not mm -hmm. stained glass in the medieval way. Oh, uh, wow. But all of the glass for these windows was manufactured exactly for these windows to his mm -hmm. specifications. Opalescent glass, they use layers, sometimes three or four layers to get the desired shading and color and texture. Um, that is a lot of work. <laughs> yes, for the, robes, mm -hmm. for the robes of the saints and the figures, right. it's rippled so that it looks like exactly what, what they want in that, in that uh, picture. When was the parish established? Was this its first church? Uh, no, 1870, um, Bishop Lachlan established uh, the church, mm -hmm. and they were located down on Fifth Avenue, okay. down the hill between- Not far away, no, so nearby. No, Bergen was... Street and St. Mark's. They had that block front on Fifth Avenue. Okay. Uh, they quickly, within one year, built a, a church, which they knew that would be temporary because uh, the parish was growing very quickly. Park Slope was filling up with Irish and German immigrants. And so that church um, only lasted about 10 years before the, the city of New York built a, an elevated trolley line in front of it. Okay. So rather than build a new church there, the second pastor, Monsignor McCarty, decided to move up the hill which was closer to Prospect Park, right. becoming much more fashionable. Beautiful brownstones were being built in the neighborhood right up here. So what about some of the architecture now I want to get to? Some of the columns, the mm. mar marble? As you can see, there are about seven different colors of granite used for the columns. Very subtle, different shades. And in order to do that, they had to get two different kinds from Scotland. They went to Westerly, Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, 
Uh, the stone on the large arches around the crossing comes from Nova Scotia. Why? I'm looking at the radiators. They're all painted marble. I mean, I'm guessing they're not marble radiators. <laughs> What's the story behind that? <laughs> Actually, what you're looking at is we had a movie filmed here, a scene from Mona Lisa Smile. Really? Some Julia years, Roberts. Some yeah. years back, yes. They did a wedding scene, and they said, Father, we, we could do that a little better. And so they painted it to look like marble. They yeah, you're also, not going to argue with Julia Roberts. They also redid the confessionals to make them more antique looking, because those are not original also. They were, they were redone. What about um, the pews themselves? They're sort of cut off at the end. It doesn't really extend to the wall. Yes. The pews are beautifully carved, and they're original. Mm -hmm. After 100 years, a lot of them were in bad shape. Okay. So they saved the best and eliminated about half of them. So uh, we're only looking about half of the, the seating in pews. Uh, it used to seat about 1,200. Now it's probably about 600. This stained glass is really beautiful. I mean, it's, very it's magnificent. Magnificent and one striking. Of, one of the most beautiful windows, I, I believe, that you'll see anywhere. It's the Nativity of the Lord and the mm -hmm. visit of the shepherds, and it's by Locke. It begins the whole scene of the life of Christ, which mm -hmm. wraps around the apse and continues over to the to the um, ascension. So window. chronologically, it starts here. Yes. And goes straight across. That was dedicated on Christmas Day, 1917. You have the angelic choirs above the nativity scene. You have the Star of Bethlehem. You have the 12 apostles on the sides and the bottom uh, surrounding. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, a lot going on in there. And dozens of angels beautifully, beautifully dressed. Well, listen, can we head up to the altar? Certainly. Come really, this, I'm this way. so ready to see that. Oh, I meant to ask you too. You're carrying a book around. <laughs> it's Tell a little, me about the book. It's a little guidebook that I did uh, for the church. When I came as pastor uh, in 1996, there wasn't a lot of information about the church mm -hmm. itself, about the building. The history of the parish, yes, but not about the artists and the, and the artworks within. Mm -hmm. And so I started researching just for, for fun. And uh, about 10 years later, I was ready to put it in writing. And I, I published this little uh, guidebook that uh, details, uh, it actually, it was actually gives a tour of the church that anyone okay. can use. And they have them available at the rectory. So was, there's a gift shop when I came in. I can get one yes. over there. Yes. Actually, you can give me one when we're done. I'm not <laughs> <Actually>. <laughs> I'll take I'll that even, copy. I want a, I want a donation. <laughs> So tell me a bit about um, the altar as well. Yes, so we're Amazing. in the central crossing now for the 100th anniversary in 1988. This platform was built here, mm -hmm. the pews removed, and we have a freestanding altar. You can see how the, the columns of the altar mimic the columns in the altar rail. The pulpit is actually uh, reworked from a chancel bench. That was a large chair. Yeah, it looks like the back of a chair. But I, I will show you the original pulpit because we're heading towards it and it's very interesting. This angel was part of the original pulpit. Okay. And it's solid bronze. It weighs really? over a thousand pounds. It's got to be heavy, I was going to say. It was made by the Gorman, the Gorham Manufacturing Company, you know, the ones who mm -hmm. do silverware. Okay. And it actually uh, was exhibited in Chicago in the World Exhibition of. Uh, 1892, and it won first place in its prize. Not this one, this is a copy of that. Well, let's, if we can, move up, look at the altar. Can yes. we move up closer to? Sure. Why don't we pause here for a moment because we can get a look at the side chapels. Uh, the statuary on this side, the altar is called Our Lady of the Assumption. It's actually a composite because we see Mary holding the child. And it, as you can see, it's very elaborate. She's surrounded by angels. Each one has a unique musical instrument. Uh, there's angels awaiting her in heaven with the crown, uh, the coronation of the Blessed Virgin. The child Jesus is also under the altar. So we have the nativity. We have Joseph, her spouse. We have uh, Anne, her mother. And we also have on this side the um, statue of the Sacred Heart. It's a large statue of Jesus with his arms embracing the world. And we have St. John the Evangelist, and we have Mary Magdalene mm -hmm. uh, to each side there. It's a beautiful, beautiful altar work. It really is. What about on the floor, this mural? Mm. Um, 
Tell me about that. Well, this, that this is a, a beautiful story. marble mosaic of the pious pelican. Do you know the story of the pious pelican? No, you're going to tell me. It became, <laughs> it became uh, very early in the church a symbol for Christ because the pelican, the mother pelican was thought to pierce her own breast uh, to feed her young with her blood if she didn't have food for them. So she would sacrifice herself for her young. And so obviously the, it became a symbol of Christ shedding his blood for, for the church. Is that symbol, um, is that something that's unique to, that you would see commonly in yes. this church or oh, this pretty is, much every Catholic church? This, is, this is one of four in this church, so the pastor must have, must have loved it. But you can see that in, uh, in churches throughout the diocese uh, if you look carefully probably. Okay. We're standing in front of probably the most elaborate altar screen in the diocese for sure. Um, and you'll see the centerpiece is, it's a gold tabernacle by the architect, uh, Alfred Parfit. It was done in 1895. It's solid silver coated with uh, 18 karat gold. gold. And it has uh, diamonds and other jewels um, decorating it. All of that metal and jewels, all the jewels, were donated by parishioners. Really? The pastor asked to bring jewelry. Um, so you'll see there are a lot of engagement and wedding ring diamonds on the front of that. Very expensive, I'm guessing. Yes, very, very. It's probably the most elaborate tabernacle in the country. And it would cost a, a half a million to replace easily. And that's obviously very heavy, too. <laughs> yes, yes. That's a heavy yes. piece. So moving up uh, to the ceilings and the murals on the ceilings. Well, what you see above us painted on the, on the ceiling of the apse is all that's left of uh, Alexander Locke's original painting. Mm -hmm. He would have uh, stenciled the entire church. Here we have angels, um, all classes of angels hovering above the altar. Um, Locke started as a muralist. He was trained uh, by John Lafarge and he worked uh, decorating the Vanderbilt houses in New York City and, and, and suburbs. Then he went into uh, glass work. But so this is all original? Yes. From the church? That is. And at the same time he was doing the, the glass, was he doing this as well? Yes. Yeah. So this would have been done around 1916. Right. Yes. Getting to the unique thing about this church, one of the items we discussed before, and you were sort of keeping me hanging about that. Oh, sure. I'm yes, Ab absolutely. <laughs> Although, Nick, it's, it's actually in my book, so okay. maybe you should just buy the book. Yes, uh, I'll buy the book. <laughs> I thought that was my copy when we're done. Oh, <laughs> come on. There is something, it's actually original to the church, so it has a great history. Okay. And I believe it's, it's made by Tiffany. But actually, uh, it has a newer history and a newer claim to fame. And that's why people have great interest in it when they come to visit the church. Okay. Yeah. So what I'm describing is actually our presider's chair. As you can see, it's a massive uh, and beautifully carved oak chair. This is where the, the priest um, sits. Yeah, so the carving is similar to the original pulpit. Right. Yes, so exactly. So that's why we think it's Tiffany? Well, I believe, I researched, we don't have any documentation, but uh, it was purchased and, uh, at the same time right. as the pastor was purchasing vestments, glass, uh -huh. lamps from Tiffany. Um, but it also has some newer history. Which is? And you'll see we have a little plaque on the back of the chair. Okay. And it says, this chair was used by His Holiness, Pope John Paul II, at Shea Stadium. Really? On October 3rd, 1979. I bet you didn't know the Pope was a Mets fan. Huh? <laughs> would have thought he was an Angels fan, actually. <laughs> actually, it was the Pope's first visit to New York, and he had Mass at Yankee Stadium, but then the Diocese of Brooklyn hosted a prayer service at Shea Stadium, and they asked St. Augustine if they could uh, use, borrow the chair for the Holy Father, and so the Pope sat in this chair at uh, Shea Stadium. Wow. And it's interesting because the cross that we have on the side of the chair that's our La Monica cross. We commissioned it for the 125th anniversary of the parish, okay. but that was 1995. And Tom Glisson, uh, the artist, was working with the archdiocese for the mass, the papal mass in Central Park. And they needed an original processional cross for the Holy Father's mass. 
And so that's so. that they came and borrowed that. <laughs> this is so original. Yes. I mean, really, it's a great story too. Yeah. So I can, uh, I'd ask to sit in that, but could, do people sit in it? Sure. They'd probably burst into a ball of flames. So every, probably not sit in the chair. Every <laughs> every every child making their first communion. Who wants to jump in the chair? Pops in there for pictures. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, listen. With that, I'm going to say thank you so much, Father Bob. It was and my pleasure. I really appreciate it. You took the time to do this. Um, I know currently, so the viewers know, you were, pa you were pastor here until a year and a half ago. Yes. And the current pastor, uh, Father Tom Father. Ahern, yes. highly recommended that you do this tour because you're the expert, of yes. course, with the book. Yes. So thank you to Father uh, Tom as well. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, we look forward to the next time I see you. Thank you. I Your own parish it. is where? Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament in Bayside. In Bayside. Yes. Okay. I will so, see you there. Thank you. Thanks again. And with that, we conclude this episode of City of Churches here at St. Augustine. And if you'd like more information on this church or any other church in our series, you can log on to www.netny.net. And if you'd like to suggest a church we should profile, you can log on as well. Until then, I'm Nick Vavis with City of Churches.